Hey folks, inside this edition of the CPTSD podcast, we're going to do part two of my conversation with Asha Clinton, who developed advanced integrative therapy. We're going to talk about how to identify if you have this deep, dark feeling that you get from trauma, how, how that shows up in our life. We're going to talk a little bit about the humanitarian aid that uh, AIT does worldwide and how that works. And we're also going to talk about Asha's number one thing to treat when you enter therapy. I hope you see what I'm talking about when I say she's the best. See y'all inside. <laughs> Asha, one of the things that we don't talk a lot about in um, in therapy in general is that this darkness, we're, we've been calling it depression, and it absolutely shows up as depression if you go down the depression checklist. Oh, sure. You know? But this darkness can appear as any diagnosis. And so you don't have to be diagnosed with depression to experience the darkness that we're talking about. Mine came through primarily with anxiety. Mm -hmm right? Would you talk a little bit about how somebody might identify if they have that darkness that we're speaking of? But I know that a part of them already knows that, but it might be helpful for the intellect to hear some ways to identify it. Sure. Let's say you get up one morning and you had five things on your list that you were going to do that day. Oh, I just don't feel like it. In fact, I don't feel like having breakfast. It's too much trouble. That's sinking into the darkness. Mm -hmm. Another way is <clears throat> you have a fight with someone. Maybe, maybe it's your boy or girlfriend. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's one of your kids. Doesn't matter who. And after it's over and they've left, you sit there and you show yourself 27 ways in which you didn't do a good job communicating to that person. Yep. You've lost the understanding that no one and nothing is perfect. Or the one that used to bug me the most years ago. Um, something happens and it's five days later when you finally stop judging yourself and showing yourself the 27 different ways what you said was horrendous. When of course it was human sized, it wasn't horrendous. But there's a kind of negative perfectionism that comes out in a lot of us. I certainly remember it in my parents. Where did I get it from? And then there's the blame business. Mm. That's your fault, kid. Yep. And you learn from a parent who's very judgmental to blame yourself for everything. And your character, such as it is, makes it far more horrible, makes everything you did, makes every horrible bad thing you did a hundred times more horrible than it actually was because you're actually a fairly benign person. Right. Average. <laughs> yeah. Which is yeah. average. And this is normal everyday people that I'm describing. I'm not describing someone who is in an institution somewhere. Right. This is every day. I, my mother has been dead since 1989. And I think if, if I suddenly had to, I could write down for you every last criticism she made of me and my sister. Yep. Right because there's still something there that has to be treated. It's very little in my life now, thank God. But the fact that I could even remember it to give you as an example says it all. Mm -hmm. You know, Asha, I was afflicted with that hyper responsibility. And what comes with that is also a tendency to then try and cast the blame out to other people. So Right. So that is a cycle to be aware of. And I remember one time, would you like to hear a short story about that? Well, of course. Okay. So I'm a therapist at this point in my life and have been doing my trauma work for a good long time. 
And I took my son, who was three at the time, to one of the really big screens to watch a documentary about the Hubble telescope. He loved space. And so we went to watch all of the space things. And he's just sitting beside me happily eating popcorn while we're learning about this super, supernova that is creating stars. It's the birthplace of stars. Wow. And, and he's having a great time. In my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, great. Now I have that to be responsible for. I literally thought <laughs> wow, that I needed to be responsible for the birthing of new stars. And so I went back into therapy to work out some of that responsibility <laughs> drive again. But if you sit, I'm speaking to our audience, if you sit wondering if you coulda, shoulda, woulda, there's a chance that you're at the brink of what we're talking about here, slipping into that self-criticism. And if you already know that you do that, one of the things that you said at the beginning, Asha, is just to bring that into awareness more and more currently when it's happening, I'm doing that thing again, where I'm feeling over responsible. So this isn't AIT therapy that we're giving you right now. It's just a way for you to start to therapy. That's true. (laughs) That's true. And it's a way for you to be also begin to communicate with whatever therapist or helper you might be working with. Um, I'll show one last question for you before I say, do you have anything else that you would like to tell us about? One of the things that I really love about AIT is that it's a fantastic therapy, yes, but it also has a couple of components that a lot of other modalities don't. One is humanitarian aid, and the other is that comes along with that, and I think what you know grounds that purpose is the sense of community. And um, just to note before I get to the question, we also interject from our society at large just making a blanket statement for people like whatever system you're growing up with, you're getting introjects from that as well as anything traumatizing as well as anything positive. Right. Right. And so my question to you is when you're thinking about working with a community or finding a community that might be spiritual in nature, how do we judge? This is a huge question, Asha. How do we judge if a community is safe? Boy, is that a good question. I know it. (laughs) Beautiful. The majority of people, as far as I can tell so far, everyone wants safety and everyone needs it. This This isn't an option. This is necessity. The question is really, can you tell who and what is safe for you mm-hmm. and who and what isn't? Funny old family story. I was a cultural anthropologist before I became a psychotherapist. Talk about good combinations of knowledge base. Yeah. I was really lucky. And I got uh, a grant to do my dissertation field work in what is now North Macedonia. Fascinating place. I was there for almost a year and a half and in some way I'm still there. Um, I had a mother who tried to control her children to the point of sickness. Hmm. So every week I would get a letter from her from New York to Macedonia. And the letter would say in slightly different words, the same thing each time. You're not strong enough. I'm gonna do it in her accent. Zoling, you're not strong enough. You're not healthy enough. You should take your husband and come back home. It's safer here for you. I lived in a village of 711 people for a year. They were farmers. The cash crop was tobacco. Some of those wonderful Turkish cigarettes that Americans used to like came from that village. They lived normal lives. They had normal families with normal children and normal festivals during their holidays. It was very much 
a, a life in parallel with maybe how American life was in the 19th century. There was nothing to be scared of. My mother was European born, so she had some sense of what uh, villages would be like in, in Europe. There was nothing to be scared of whatsoever. People were so lovely and so helpful. But she had grown up during World War I and she lived in Europe right there where the war was. And so there's nothing safe. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So the first thing you need to do if you're going to be safe is to figure out with some clarity of consciousness whether there's a problem with safety in the first place. Brilliant. <laughs> she never figured this out. I mean, I remember her on her deathbed in my house. Same kind of thing. And I saw one part of me that's... Uh, that's a little mean, wanted to say to her, sweetie, you're on your deathbed. Am I the one who should be safe? Perspective. No. Perspective, yes. Mm -hmm. So if, if we have people in the United States who would like to contact AI or worldwide, but you have humanitarian efforts worldwide already, I'm wondering about clinicians in the United States, if if there is a an example of what would create a situation where AIT could come in and help a community get some tools. Um, let me give you two different examples, both from Guatemala, because that's where we've done our, our most extensive work. Talk about beautiful places. Okay, so... One year I was I was in Guatemala. I had made my first contact with a Guatemalan psychotherapist at an ASEP conference. She had invited me to come and teach there. And after two or three years of sort of pushing at her, aren't there people other than the city people who are the elite in Guatemala whom I can work with too? I'm happy to work with with city people who are elite psychotherapists, but I wanna work with anybody who could use the work. So finally, she made contact with a group of women who are called CACLA, that's their organization's name. Uh, and these women who were all in their 20s and 30s at the time, they were victims of a genocidal war that happened in Guatemala from 1970 to the year 2000, roughly. And it was explained to us that they had all sorts of trauma and they weren't able to function well enough because they had traumas like being raped serially, um, having to stand and watch while some man with, with a rifle killed every member of their family who mm -hmm. then fell backwards into a pit. It looked to me like Germany in, in the 40s. Mm. I couldn't say no to that, not that I would have wanted to in any part of me, but I just said, when do we do it? Mm -hmm. we, have, we were there for 18 years running, a few weeks each time we went working with all the women we could work with because that was obviously what needed to be done the most. So there, you know, we came into a situation of total past trauma and were able to turn it around. My favorite part of it is that all 24 of the original group of women are now AIT uh, teachers. They're not just people who give AIT to other people. They teach it as well. So I am not surprised. <laughs> it, it was so wonderful to see how they grew, how they healed, and they're lovely women. Hmm. So that's one. Then there's another tribe. These women were Mayan women. There's a tribe called the Shinka, which is on the other side of Guatemala. And 
they were sort of enslaved by the Spaniards, uh, the conquistadores. We're talking 500 years ago mm -hmm. when, the Span when the Spaniards first came to Latin America. And they were having interactive problems that was sort of like family feuds. A family would kill off another family because of some disagreement or dispute. Um, so we've been there a number of times. And as far as I know, the latest I've heard is they're not fighting each other like that anymore. They got the idea that you didn't have to kill other families. And understand these are people who went through all the wars in Guatemala. There have been many. Uh, and I'm not there right now because I've had information that it's not safe. Mm. And I appreciate very much when my colleagues there can say to me, wait a few months, we'll see when we can go and do this project. It's a different motivation for your safety than your mom had. Quite. And I trust it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Asha, you mentioned ASEP, and I just wanted to throw out there that that is the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. I've mentioned it lots of times on this podcast. And I think that you're going to be a speaker at the next ASEP conference. So I'll be looking forward to that. Is there any... I'm very, I'm very excited about it, in fact because I'm getting to present the work we've developed uh, in AIT, healing illnesses. Oh, yeah. That sounds really exciting. I'm very excited about it. I've been working on it for maybe 30 years. Well, with that, I'm going to on, on air invite you back <laughs> to talk about that whenever you're ready. Uh, because as we know, most people with complex trauma have some form of suffering physically. Um, and it can be wide ranging, but in my experience, a lot of chronic type illnesses. So definitely, but now more and more understanding about how you can actually let that go. I'm working with one young woman now who has six different illnesses simultaneously. We've been working since, I think since October. And now she only has four. Right on. Mm. That's right. Well, I was, working, I, I, I was working against my my own interest in a sense because I was afraid we'd fail. It seemed it seemed like, you know, who could do that? But you can. Uh, well, we can. We can. She's quite a young woman. She has she has enough potential to make herself that sick. That tells you she has the same amount of potential to do whatever positive thing she wants to do in the world. So I, I guarantee that if I had found AIT in my early 20s, I would have lived a different life. That doesn't mean that I've had a bad life. I'm not upset about my life, but with the things I've dealt with, I definitely could have had a different start, which is one of the reasons I preach AIT so much. Um, and I don't know, Asha, if you have been around the social media platform, TikTok, but there is a lot of education going on there. You may or may not want to enter the stream. It's a lot of information. Um, I think TikTok is going to help us redefine client experiences so that we can self-identify when we're not well quicker. And my point in saying that is I have hope ridiculously because of TikTok. <laughs> that we're going to heal younger and younger and younger than somebody like me, right? I mean, I'm I'm a full-on Gen Xer. Therapy wasn't really kosher or appropriate or something you talked about until I was in my mid to late 20s. And that's changed. Yes, it has. I'm always, I'm always amazed at it because I'm just, just a little bit older than you. Just a little bit. Thanks for leading the way. I needed it. <laughs> well, I am very glad if I was leading the way that it led you and a, a number of other people. For me, a lot of the value of AIT at this point in my life is the beautiful people it brings me toward. And you are definitely one. 
Oh, Asha, thank you. I'm literally blushing. Good. (laughs) I'm going to let that sink in so I remember. And in answer answer to your question of a couple of minutes ago, I would love to come back. Thank you. We can plan that. Yes. So so in saying goodbye for today, um, what is one item that you would like to give to the audience? Anything you want. Never give up. Mm. If I had given up a hundred times on my own woundedness and then new modalities like AIT came along, what a loss. And I don't mean I'm big and special and dumb stuff like that. I mean, because I didn't give up, I had a really interesting life. Mm. And because I didn't give up, I didn't die of some horrible illness and I'm still here. Mm-hmm. Giving up is the the desire to give up is probably the first thing we should treat in every client. Yeah. If, if this is illegal, of course, but if I could pull out all the people I've worked with over the years who did not give up, and that's most of them. Mm -hmm. What a bunch of beautiful human beings. I mean, and if I had given up and I had reason, just like you did, just like most of us do, AIT probably wouldn't have happened in in any way we would recognize. It's, It's needed right now. I am very happy to go off to Guatemala and do what I'm gonna do there. But there's one more thing. I have been plotting the last two, three years of starting AIT circles wherever there is a need for them. And it's just a matter of a relatively simple training for people who want to lead AIT circles. And for the rest of us, there would be a way to work on trauma without the expense of working on trauma. I'm very concerned that therapy has become too expensive for anybody who needed it to go get it. But if we had these circles in in all our communities and maybe once a week, what they did was trauma work together and one person knew the method well enough so that they could teach it to the other people, you wouldn't have to be virtually rich to get help. I'm in, Asha. You let me know when and where and I will show up. And you're absolutely right. My time, my individual time as a therapist is very expensive because I only have so much of it. And I mean, ethically and morally, that's one of the reasons I am doing this podcast is to try and help people, right? Um, So if, if we wanted to reach out to AIT for more information about getting some community support or interest in circles or becoming trained, um, I usually send people to AITI.org. Is that correct? Yep. Um, I don't know that we've put anything up about it yet. Okay. But they could contact you with questions there. Contact me. Absolutely. Okay. Asha, thank you so much for being here today. I learned and um, I'm still geeking out and I'm still blushing. And so (laughs) (laughs) with that, I will say I'm going to hold you to that next podcast date and um, everybody in the audience, if this touched you in some way, please feel free to reach out to Asha or myself and let us know. And um, we wish you the best and your idea, Asha, of never giving up. It's crucial. Thank you so much for being here. You are so welcome. It was a pleasure for me. Thank you.